This week, we're talking about a great camera to bring around with you for casual photo shoots and how to achieve natural lighting when you don't have natural lighting in your scene. Hey guys, and welcome to Flurn. My name is Aaron Nace, and you can find me on flurn.com, where we make learning fun. This is our Q&A segment, and if you have a question for me and the Flurn team, all you have to do is leave it in a comment right down below this video. We scrape through all of our videos each week, and we find all the coolest questions, and we put them on here. I got a little iPad here with all the questions on it, and I read them, and I answer the questions. So if I answer your question, you're going to win a free month of our Flurn Pro subscription, where you get access to every pro tutorial we've ever made, including our Lightroom presets and Photoshop actions. It's a really, really great deal. So without any further ado, here are the questions for this week. Is there a trick to reduce banding when you add a black and white gradient to your images? So anytime you're adding a bit of a gradient to the images, whether you're creating a vignette around the edges, you have a light background, you're going to see the different steps of that gradient. And it's because a photo contains like crazy tons amount of information and colors. But a basic gradient, you're just going from like white to like light gray to medium gray to dark gray to black. And there are not that many changes or steps in that gradient. So you're gonna tend to see those steps. There are a couple of things that you can do to reduce those steps that you're going to see. The first is you wanna work in your image in 16 bit, okay? So if you're working in an eight bit JPEG, you have a lot less information to work with. So work with your image in 16 bit. It's going to give you a lot more colors going from white all the way to black or tones in this case. The next thing I suggest doing is applying a noise filter to your image. And this is gonna help out with your banding quite a bit. You don't need to add a ton of noise, but basically the noise kind of breaks up the banding pattern and it's going to look a lot more natural. So to do this in Photoshop, just go to filter, down to noise, over to add noise, choose your mount, and poof, your banding is gone. Poof. Hey Aaron, what's the best lighting setup to make your subject look natural when you don't have any source of natural light? All right, so let's talk about natural light. And for that, we're gonna take a second and think about the sky. It's big, it's bright, it looks really nice when it's cloudy, and it's above you. And that's what creates natural light. It's kind of everywhere, but it's coming from above. So any steps you can take to replicate any of those things that the sky does naturally will be really great. The larger you can make your apparent light source, the more natural that light is going to be. And if you can make it come from pretty much above you, and not just in one place, but kind of all over the places, your light source is gonna look a little bit more natural as well. So one thing you can do is if you do have any flashes, like a flash that you put on top of your camera or a flash that's an external flash, like a Pro Photo or an Einstein or whatever you have, if you can point those up into a room that has a ceiling, let's say you have a white ceiling in a room, then the light is gonna hit the ceiling, it's gonna bounce around up there and it's gonna come back and it's gonna appear like a much larger light source, which is going to look a little bit more natural than if you're just pointing that flash right at a person. Now, if you're not planning on adding light to your scene, there are some things that you can do to capture people in very low light environments that's still going to make them look plenty natural. And that usually is going to involve shooting with a lens that has a super wide maximum aperture. So we're talking about the f1.4s here. They're going to let a ton of light in. And if you're in a dark room and everyone is equally lit by this dark room. If you can capture li enough light to make the dark room actually look light, then they're gonna look pretty natural in that scene as well. So you don't have to always add a bunch of lights. Now, and you're probably gonna need to bump up your ISO quite a bit. So if you're on a newer camera, maybe a mirrorless, those are gonna be really great in low light situations. So you can still capture your subject even when there's not a lot of light and still make it look like light. So. Big key here is making sure that light source is going to be large and broad and fairly even across the subject. So that can be done during the day or at night. Nice beard, Aaron. How do you keep it so short? I forgot to bring my beard trimmer thing. Oh. That actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, 
what do you think about Lightroom CC and Lightroom CC Classic? What's good and bad? And will you make a tutorial on the new Lightroom CC? So the good news is we are making a tutorial on Lightroom CC and Lightroom CC Classic so you can have your eye out. So we're gonna start off with Lightroom CC Classic. Now, basically they just rebranded the Lightroom that's been around for years that we all super comfortable with and we already like it. So it's now called Lightroom CC Classic. Now they did add a couple of features and that's really great. This is the program that I'm going to continue using because I think if you're looking for like advanced tools and a lot of features and options and a really great, nice workflow. If you're taking a lot of pictures, CC Classic is still the way to go. So moving forward, that's the program that I'm gonna be using for my own workflow. Now, the program that they just came out with is called Lightroom CC. This is basically a cloud-based push on Adobe's part. They're getting into the cloud, they want you to put all your photos on the cloud, and they are making it easier to edit your photos on the go. It does have some ups and downs. Some of the ups are if you are entering your photos into the new Lightroom CC, of course they get on the cloud. So that means you've got your photos you know, here at your house and you wanna access them anywhere else in the world. Really cool. If all your images are on the cloud, well, you have a backup of those photos. So you don't have to worry if your house burns down, your computer explodes, whatever, uh, you're gonna have that backup. Now, there are all kinds of other backup solutions you can have out there, but in that case, Lightroom CC is really nice for that as well. Now, if you are a working photographer and you take a lot of photos and those photos are gonna be shot in high resolution, to upload all that stuff to the cloud makes absolutely no sense for me. I, I don't want it do that. If I just have like the photos in my portfolio uploaded to the cloud, or maybe I want to just upload like a session of photos and then have someone choose their favorites in a different location, that starts to make more sense. But if you're a working photographer and you take a bunch of pictures, uh, uploading all that to the cloud is just a giant waste of space. In my opinion, they have a really good thing going on with their mobile apps and they're trying to take what they're doing with their mobile apps and integrate that onto the desktop. I, I can see like there's definitely use for this, but I, I think that a lot of people are gonna say, well, why would I use this additional program that's less powerful than the one I'm used to using? And I'm, I'm in that boat. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm probably not really going to use this program. I do feel like for people who are just starting out, who've never even seen Lightroom before, that Lightroom CC is a great option. You know, you're a family person, you're not taking that many photos, you wanna do some light editing on your photos. I think Lightroom CC is a great option for those folks. But I think anyone who's been using Lightroom for years is not really gonna be spending too much time in Lightroom CC. I kind of wanted to rip on Adobe a little bit yeah. more. I don't know. I'd like to see a tutorial about double exposure in camera. Mine has this function, I know how to use it, but I'm not getting great results that I've seen in other people's images. Could you provide some tips and techniques? Best regards. So the original double exposure, the OG, I shouldn't say that. I'm too much of a dork to say that. It's too late. Got a camera. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so the original double exposure was basically just done with film. Basically you take one picture on a piece of film and then without rolling the film, you just take another picture and it exposes that same film to light again. This is done a bunch of times in the old days just by total mistake. And every now and then they came out really cool. And then when digital came along, it's like super easy because you could just take any photo and any other photo pop them together in Photoshop, change a couple blending modes, and you got yourself a double exposure. The whole idea with making a good double exposure is you gotta play with your lights and your darks because you're mixing the light exposure of two photos. So for instance, if you have a photo that has an all dark background with a light subject on it, then you can take another photo with a dark subject and superimpose that on the light subject and then you're gonna have your cool double exposure effect or you can go the other way around. But if you're in a scene that has, just has like pretty medium contrast and then you mix another medium contrast scene, well, you're not really gonna see something that fantastic because you're not working with the contrast between light and dark. While you have a new fancy digital camera that allows you to do this in camera, and that's totally awesome, it's still gonna be way easier to do this in Photoshop, uh, and we actually have a tutorial on how to do that. So we'll just put that link on the screen right now. You can watch how to create a double exposure in Photoshop, uh, and then do this with any images that you'd like. Also have fun with it in your camera. 
Could you explain more about blend if? When do you use this level and underlying level and some of the other features? Thanks, you rock. You rock. You rock. Rock. Uh, I can't do that. <laughs> anyway. anyway, so basically how blend if works is it allows you to blend any layer that you're on with the layers underneath it. It's got a lot of really cool uses. I'm sure you're going to think of your own uses and it's really easy to get to. Just click on your layer, go to FX and over to blending options and you're going to see two sliders down at the bottom. So you'll see a this layer slider and an underlying layer slider. So this layer basically controls how the layer itself blends in based on light and dark information. So you can use the slider to make the darks disappear from the layer or the lights disappear from the layer. So big tip here, you wanna make sure you hold Alt or Option and click on those little sliders. That's gonna separate them out, giving you feathering, making those effects look a little bit more realistic. So if you're coming from the left hand side, it's gonna make your darks start to disappear. If you're coming from the right hand side, it's gonna make your lights disappear. So that's on this layer and it's the less useful of the two. The next is for underlying layer and this is where it gets a little bit more useful. So let's just say you paint white on a layer. You just have a layer that's totally white, okay? And you wanna make the highlights of your subject a little bit brighter. So you can just make a white layer right above your subject and then go into blend if and then where it says underlying layer it's not going to look at the white layer it's going to look at what's underneath it which is your subject and you can basically just take your slider from the left hand side again remember to hold alt or option that's super important and click and drag from the left to the right it's going to make the white layer disappear where the underlying layer is dark meaning it's only going to show up where the underlying layer is light meaning the highlights so it's gonna make the highlights brighter. So this is one cool use of blend diff. Basically you can enhance highlights by you know, just having a layer be visible only where the underlying layers are lighter. And as you can imagine, you can do the exact opposite with your shadow. So ton of uses here. You can use it for color work. You could use it for compositing. There's a billion different uses, but basically it's just blending how one layer blends in with the rest of your photo. This is the last question. Deal with it. What's your favorite gear for everyday casual shoots? So if I'm just out and about with friends and just taking like super casual photos, honestly, most of those are gonna be done on my iPhone. Really good pictures you can send to your friends. Everyone likes them, put a big smile on everyone's faces. For something a little bit more uh, photographic, something a little bit more serious, but something you can carry around with you, I highly recommend a cropped frame mirrorless. Pentax makes a great one. Olympus makes a great one. Fuji makes a great one. Even Sony, you kind of get the look of them, right? They're all like metal and they look retro and they're actually really great cameras. I super enjoy using them. And this is a great market because those cameras aren't very large and they still produce great images. Now, if I'm gonna go like hang out with some friends and try to take some like serious type photos where I wanna make them the best I can possibly make them, uh, generally I'll be shooting with the Canon 5D Mark III. It's a full frame camera. And I'm gonna be shooting with a 35 millimeter 1.4 lens. I love the wide view of a 35. You can get a lot in your scene. You can also get really close to your subject, which creates really intimate photos. It'll knock the background super out of focus, and it's going to give you a lot of potential to shoot in low light conditions, which is pretty much when all the fun happens, right? After the sun setting, people are doing all kinds of fun things, and that's when interesting pictures are made a lot of the time. So for me personally, I'm shooting most of this stuff on my iPhone and with a full frame camera. But that middle category, don't forget it because those cameras are really kick ass, they're super small and portable, and the image quality is really great. Not to mention they look kind of the coolest out of any of it. That's the coolest looking bunch. So if you're into looking cool, go get yourself a Fuji. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who entered your question. Again, if you have a question for me and the rest of the Florin team, just leave it in a comment right down below this video. If we get to you, we'll give you a free month of Florin Pro. This week, we talked about my favorite camera when out on the go. Now we're gonna flip the lens to you. That didn't make any sense. What's your favorite camera when you're out and about and trying to take some pictures of your family and friends and just general good times? What's your go-to camera and lens combination to take some great photos without taking a bunch of equipment for you? Let us know in a comment right down below. Thanks so much, guys. I'll flirt you later. Bye, everyone. You rock, man. <laughs> Do I have a bald patch there now? <laughs>
Oh, don't mind me. Boop, boop, choo. <sighs> Honey, would you mind running out to the gardening department at our local hardware store? I'm low on my shaving equipment. Yes, only Brits shave. I'm gonna cut my ear off on accident. <laughs>